Hello, welcome. Today I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. James Hopkisson, who is the UK medical lead at TFP Fertility UK. Welcome, Dr. Hopkisson. Uh, thank you very much for having me uh, on your podcast. Of course. So we want to talk today all about IUI and we've got some brilliant questions to ask you. First of all, please could you introduce yourself and your role at TFP Fertility? I'm the UK medical lead for TFP Fertility UK. I've been working in the field of IVF since 1993 and started my training in Oxford uh, and now work at TFP Nurture uh, up in Nottingham uh, as the lead clinician there um, running the Fertility and I IVF programme. What is IUI and what does it stand for? IUI stands for interuterine insemination. It's one of our fertility treatments where we can offer an improvement over the chances of natural conception. When you look at IUI, you can use either partner sperm or donor sperm. They're essentially the same, same process. Um, I always say to people, uh, just think of IUI as a treatment where we're putting the best swimming sperm back in the right place at the right time. And that can be combined with stimulation of the ovaries if you have problems with ovulation or just in a natural cycle. When is it recommended and who for? It's quite contentious uh, now following the NICE guidelines published in 2014. Um, the recommended use of IUI seems to have been more limited and it's hotly debated when we should be using IUI. Across Europe, um, many people will use IUI as a second line treatment for unexplained subfertility. So if we've done tests of, uh, tests of ovulation, uh, the sperm is normal and the tubes are open, uh, moving forward with IUI is a reasonable way forward. However, NICE uh, looked at the evidence base, which isn't particularly good, and suggested uh, that it wasn't particularly cost effective, so recommended moving forward with IVF if you've been trying for two years um, and have not conceived. It is very good for people who are using donor gametes or who want to avoid going down the route of IVF because they don't want to create excess embryos. Um, there's a concern about the level of intervention uh, of IVF. So um, we can use IUI in a number of settings, and it's always so important to individualize care so that people are, feel comfortable with the form of treatment they're going forward with. In somebody's, say, using donor sperm, where there's no fertility problem, um, apart from the lack of, lack of sperm, IUI is one of the first line treatments. We usually call that DI, uh, donor insemination, but they're exactly the same thing. Which can be done with frozen sperm? Yes, so IUI can be done with frozen sperm if uh, somebody has banked sufficient sperm prior to oncology treatment, that sperm can be used in insemination. It's more frequently used in, in IVF programs because of the amount of sperm that's available. But um, most donor programs, uh, same-sex women, single women, will we'll be able to use uh, frozen donor sperm in an IUI process. What is the process for IUI at TFP Fertility and how long does it take? So usually the rate limiting step is getting you matched to donor sperm and getting sperm uh, on site in the unit. At TFP UK, we have our own donor bank. We've been actively recruiting um, so matching with donor sperm can be done with UK donors or donors from abroad. If you're using partner sperm, the process just fits into a normal menstrual cycle. There are some investigations that we do need to do prior to commencing IUI or DI. Um, it's very important to know whether ovulation is occurring. So checking uh, either with ultrasound scan or blood tests for ovulation in a regular cycle. 
always checking to see that the tubes are open, and that can be done either with an X-ray test, something called a hysterosal fingergram, or an ultrasound test, a high cosy or high fosy. Uh, some people will have, have gone down the route of having laparoscopy and uh, the tubes checked by uh, squirting some dye through the tubes to see that they're open. So we do need to know that the tubes are functioning and normal because having damaged tubes will decrease your chance of success with IUI. So with um, all that information behind us, we'll work out a program, whether to go through treatment using a natural cycle with no ovulation, uh, no ovulation induction, so no medication to boost ovulation, or if needed, somebody with polycystic ovaries, say, who isn't ovulating each month, we would either give tablet forms of medication to boost ovulation or injections of hormones called gonadotrophins, FSH, which stands for follicle stimulating hormone, to induce ovulation and boost the chances of success. And uh, you're very right in saying about checking tubes, because, of course, if there's a limit to the amount of sperm that someone has, you want to ensure that everything has been cross-checked before using it. That's right. It's not possible just to tell from history whether the tubes are open. And I think it is very important. And most people would, I think everybody would be really upset if they found that they'd gone through um, three to six cycles of IUI or DI incurred the expense physically, emotionally, and financially, and find that their tubes were blocked and should have been at the point of having IVF um, and having an appropriate form of treatment. What happens day by day after the IUI procedure? So we time insemination around ovulation. So in a natural cycle, we will look for the mid-cycle surge. Uh, we'll have done some scans to see that the follicle is developing and then do the insemination in the unit uh, and put the sperm back inside the uterus. A bit like a smear test, not painful. And thereafter, it is a case of waiting to see if fertilization occurs naturally. And of course, that's one of the problems with um, IUI. It doesn't give us a great deal of information about eggs, doesn't give us any information about embryo quality. So if it doesn't work, it's then moving on to another cycle and another cycle. And it's a case of working out how many cycles you would do, either unstimulated, stimulated, before moving on to another form of assisted conception. So going into that dreaded two-week wait, the 2WW, as people in the community call it, um, at what stage would you test following an IUI cycle? So... We all know that people test early uh, before the onset of a period, but, you know, it is a case of waiting to see if you miss that period and then doing a pregnancy test. Pregnancy tests now are, uh, are very accurate, um, uh, but I would always say to people, wait until, wait and see. And if, if the period ensues, obviously that's not a good sign. Um, if it doesn't, then test. Um, would you advise people have a blood test to test? No, I don't think that's really necessary. Um, in our IVF program, we uh, do urinary pregnancy tests uh, to assess, and uh, it's just another visit into the unit. If people want to have a blood test, they can do so. The, the difficulty with quantitative HCG is how many tests do you do? If you're not seeing an optimal rise, does that mean that the pregnancy isn't ongoing? And it often increases anxiety, in my opinion. Um, but of course, we will try and help in any way that we can. Um, much can be said the same for, should you have progesterone following an IUI treatment? It's not necessary. Um, but some people will want to use that in an empirical uh, setting, empirical with very little evidence base behind it. Um, because if you were conceiving naturally, you wouldn't be using progesterone afterwards. Exactly, exactly. And there are some um, concerns with progesterone use 
in assisted conception cycles, uh, in donor cycles, that you may see uh, increased blood pressure in pregnancy with the use of progesterone because of suppression of your own corpus luteum, the uh, follicle changes to a corpus luteum to produce progesterone. Um, and by suppressing that, for some reason, we're not quite sure why, uh, in uh, frozen embryo replacement and uh, egg donation programs, you can see people have higher blood pressure in pregnancy. So you have to balance out all of these things with evidence, what the risks are and what the benefits are. And you know, that's, that's something you need to discuss with the clinician when you're setting out the program for treatment. What does success look like for RUI? Again, a good question in terms of, you have to relate that to a number of factors. Patient age, whether the tubes are normal, if there are other forms of disease that may be affecting fertility, such as endometriosis, um, and whether you're using stimulation. And also you have to count in the risks when using stimulation of cancelling the cycle because you over-respond and have too many follicles, and also the risks of multiple birth. So if we take natural cycle, IUI, um, when you look at the UK national statistics um, in good centres, you're looking at a 12 to 14% success rate per cycle. Uh, with a very low multiple birth rate and a very low cycle cancellation rate. After three cycles, we'd expect a third of individuals, couples, to have conceived. When you're using donor insemination, the success rates are slightly higher because there isn't a fertility problem per se. With using stimulation, the success rates can go up from 14 to 18% per cycle. But one has to remember that um, there is a risk of producing more than three follicles or more than two follicles, and therefore the risks of multiple birth increase with the more aggressive stimulation and the um, aggressive cancellation or lack of uh, cancellation if you do have more than two follicles. Here at TFP, we tend to abandon treatment if there are more than two follicles over 14 millimeters uh, when we're monitoring in uh, a DI or RUI cycle because the risk of high order multiples is too great. Uh, and that is very, very important. You know, mindset is that we should have a healthy mother, healthy baby, and that really is looking at single, single pregnancy. RUI versus IVF, how are they different? Um, I think you can look at all fertility treatments as to the level of intervention. Uh, and that comes on a number of levels, as I've said already, um, in terms of cost, intervention physically, what you have to go through in terms of monitoring um, the procedure of IUI versus IVF. And um, if I outline an IUI cycle, that fits into a normal menstrual cycle really. We'll monitor, um, maybe have two, three scans at most to see how the follicle develops. Once you have a mid-cycle surge, we time the insemination 36 hours later. So if you say have your mid-cycle surge on Friday morning, you have insemination on Saturday. If you have it Friday evening, we'll do the insemination on Sunday. So you may have three or four visits to your fertility unit um, during a cycle of IUI. With stimulated IUI, uh, if we're using injections, you may be scanned a bit more frequently to make sure that we're running a safe program and not having lots of follicles develop. In IVF, you use significantly higher doses of medication to stimulate the ovaries to produce a number of follicles that are there in the first place and bring those follicles forward. We have to use a number of different medications to stimulate the ovaries 
and to suppress your own pituitary function that will cause ovulation. So I would say there are more interventions in terms of the medication and injections, more scans, because again, monitoring has to be tighter to optimize the time that you go to theater to collect eggs. In an IVF program, we will do an egg collection, which is an invasive procedure, usually done under sedation. Um, we pass a needle through the top of the vagina into the ovary, suck out the fluid from each follicle and hopefully get eggs. Those eggs are then fertilized in the laboratory and embryos created and we grow the embryos through to day five. We then replace an embryo back inside the uterus. Compare that to IUI, we will monitor, wait for the mid-cycle surge or, or give medication to induce ovulation and then put the sperm back inside the uterus a couple of days later, 36 hours later. Um, so there are more steps in IVF. We get to see eggs, we get to see sperm, we get to see embryos, so we get more information from IVF. And the success rates are greater because more of the steps have been done in the laboratory and we know we're putting an embryo back. Again, you have to relate all treatments to your own history, your own age, um, and what you are willing to put yourselves through, physically, emotionally, and sadly, financially, in many cases. How can someone prepare for IUI the first, second time? So preparation for any fertility uh, treatment is really, really important. You have to be in the right mindset, um, you know, being positive, as healthy, and as fit as possible. So optimizing body mass index, um, leading a healthy lifestyle, obviously taking preconceptual vitamins, folic acid and, and vitamin D is, is important. Um, and then really it is a case of fitting it into your life. You have to look at the logistics. You know, if you've got a busy working life, how are you gonna to get to the scans? How are you gonna have the insemination? How do you fit that in? Obviously talking to the, the team uh, at the unit, counseling if, if necessary for support or implications if using uh, donor sperm is very important. Um, it's, it's really optimizing your chances. If your body mass index is slightly high, if it's over 30, try to get that down below 30. Um, also, if you have a body mass index over 30, you should be using a higher dose of folic acid uh, instead of 400 micrograms, five milligrams, that uh, is prescribed by your doctor. So it's, it's setting up, is this the right treatment for you? and then uh, embarking through the cycles. And you run cycles back to back. You don't necessarily need a break in between. Mm -hmm. That again is down to you, what you want to do and how you want to fit treatment into your life. What are the waiting lists like? Why do people come to TFP Fertility UK and go outside of the NHS? That's a really good question, especially post pandemic. Um, unfortunately, a lot of things have um, been put on hold in the NHS and there are increased waiting times to be seen in clinic um, and to undergo treatment and investigation. So at TFP Fertility UK, our clinics will offer consultations, investigations and treatment without that wait. Um, currently in Nottingham, we have no wait for uh, any, any form of treatment. And all of our clinics are trying to get people to be seen within a fortnight of contacting the unit. So we understand how long people have already had to wait. I had a couple uh, yesterday that I was consulting with who had been referred into the NHS clinic locally um, and had had to wait over a year to be seen. And, uh, and the frustrations that that uh, engenders is, is, is massive. So at TFP, we will try to give you an evidence-based, individualized approach to your fertility treatment. 
um, it doesn't commit you to anything, but I think it's so, so important for people to get the right advice uh, about treatment so they can plan. Um, some people may go back into the NHS and just want to touch base to know what their fertility is like and what they should be doing. So that's something we would be happy to offer. Uh, and if people then move on to treatment with us, make sure that it's done in a timely, smooth, manner that fits you really um, to make it as easy as possible great advice and we've linked up in our bio the website for tfp fertility uk so that people can make that contact um, and get the fertility get your fertility journey going of course fertility is age sensitive isn't it so waiting a year is not necessarily okay for many people uh, definitely and um, I think everybody should be able to get advice. Normally, you know, if you are below 35, one would wait a year if everything is normal, if you're ovulating and there's no history of testicular trauma, problems with the testes that would make one suspect there's a sperm problem before embarking on investigations. Um, after a year of trying, uh, it'd be reasonable to do tests of ovulation, some hormone tests to look at ovarian reserve and a sperm test, and then be referred on to um, your local NHS fertility unit. Equally, it's reasonable to go and talk to a clinician um, outside the NHS to get advice and have those tests done privately, should you want to. Um, if you are older, and certainly if you are over 37, and have been trying for six months, I think it's reasonable to get some baseline investigations done there. Equally, if, if you have irregular cycles, a sign that you're probably not ovulating, don't wait 12 months before going to see your GP to say, I'm trying to conceive, is there something wrong? Those women with polycystic ovarian syndrome, maybe having two or three periods a year, are not gonna conceive, so need, to get that help, that may just be ovulation induction with a drug called Clomid or Letrozole, um, and need to be doing that because you have to ovulate each month to get pregnant. It's, it's not difficult. And, and I think this is where we have to sort of demystify and, and provide advice and guidance as to what you should be doing when. Um, but sadly, there is a lot of misinformation out there um, and people are waiting or are being told to wait. Um, you've got to wait a year before seeing a doctor about your fertility. That's not the case. If there is a problem that has been identified previously, like PCO, endometriosis, fibroids, you know, you should go and get an assessment. How is it different for same-sex couples versus a solo par intended parent versus a heterosexual couple to have IUI? So it's really just the donor sperm um, side of things. In a same-sex couple, um, having uh, DI, we will assess the tubes, we'll assess ovulation. Whoever wants to carry the child will go through that insemination process. Same with a single woman. With partner um, IUI, we want to know that the sperm parameters are good, that um, when you come in and look at a semen analysis, you'll look at the count, the motility, what the sperm look like, and the, the volume of ejaculate. Um, because we want to see at least 10 million motile sperm in the preparation that we're putting back inside the uterus. So there are some parameters that uh, if you're using partner sperm that you'll have to fit to make sure that IUI is successful. Donor sperm matching Base, is based on physical characteristics, height, eye color, hair color, and build. You know, if you've got some uh, specific characteristics, you want a left-handed violin playing footballer as your donor, you may have to look around to find that characteristic, and therefore your waiting time may go up. Um, at TFP Fertility UK, we will help you go through that process of donor matching, either with an in-house donor or from another sperm bank we use a number of sperm banks um, abroad in Denmark, uh, European Sperm Bank, Fios, uh, and the embryology team will help you through that to navigate that 
that maze and then get the, the samples into the unit. Uh, but otherwise, it is all pretty quick and straightforward uh, in terms of the process once you've had your consultation and know where you're going. What's the cost for IUI? The cost is less than uh, IVF. You're looking at around two to two and a half thousand pounds cycle. If you're using donor sperm, um, because the music getting the sperm uh, has a cost to it, but between a thousand and fifteen hundred pounds for uh, partner IUI. When is the best time to start IUI? When you're ready. I know that sounds uh, slightly facetious, but um, it's really difficult to say to anybody, you should start trying now. You have to be ready to move forward with fertility. Um, that decision to start trying for a family is a massive one. When delays happen, I would say, if you are worried, seek advice, ask. Um, I usually end up all of my consultations with, if you've got questions, however trivial, ask. Um, because we can't, if we don't know, we can't help. And it may be that I sit with a, a couple or an individual and say, actually, wait a little bit longer. You've only been trying for four months. You're in your late twenties, you know, give it some time. Everything looks okay. We've done some quick tests. You're ovulating, the sperm's normal. Go away, come back and see me in a little while if you haven't conceived. So timing depends on circumstances. My advice to a 28 year old would be very different to a 40 year old. So, you know, it's, it's looking at individual circumstances. There isn't a one size fits all answer to that question as to when, when you should start, but well, there probably is when you're ready. What testing is, in, is involved with IUI before starting at TFP Fertility? So um, we do the, the baseline fertility tests. We look at, are you ovulating? Do a progesterone blood test around day 21 of a 28 day cycle. Um, test the tubes to see that they are open and uh, check medical history, rubella screenings, that somebody's been immunized, chlamydia screening and thyroid function screening. Just, these aren't really just for IUI, they are your fertility workup. Um, moving forward with IUI, it is, have you got open tubes and is the sperm of good enough quality to go down that route? What about PCOS? You touched on it. Can someone with PCOS still have IUI? Is it worthwhile? Yes, it, it is. Um, I think with polycystic ovarian syndrome, or any cause of ovulatory disorder, we can give medication to boost ovulation, be that famid or letrozole as tablets or injections of FSH. And you can combine that with interuterine insemination if you want to. In donor uh, conception, if you have PCO and are using donor sperm and not ovulating, yeah, of course, we can go down the route of DI. Um, it is very, very important to have that good monitoring and the counselling beforehand that if you over-respond, we'll have to abandon the cycle. Because there's nothing worse than somebody coming up and we find three or four follicles and they're told we can't go ahead with insemination. Um, that needs to be outlined at the very beginning, what the criteria are and that we stick to those, you know, no ifs or buts, we'll just bend the rules slightly because that's when you will end up with triplets or quads um, and really that is far too much risk. So um, those people who have ovulatory disorders, you can sort that out medically and combine it with IUI or DI. Does IUI hurt? No, I, I think one has to say it's uncomfortable. Uh, doing the insemination is an intimate examination, much like a smear. Uh, if you struggle with uh, your smears and passing speculum, it's always important to let the practitioner who's doing the procedure know. There are a number of different 
um, techniques we can employ to make a speculum examination uh, a little bit easier, positioning, um, different sizes of speculums. Often people think, you know, a speculum is a speculum, but there are a range of sizes. Um, it's, it's not often talked about, but if you have problems with your smear tests, scans, um, transvaginal scanning, let the people know that are doing the procedures because there are some things that we can do to make it easier. Some people will have um, their IUI under sedation, for example, if they really struggle and have vaginismus and passage of a uh, speculum is really uh, too difficult, we can do things under sedation. So it is, again, tailoring treatment to the individual and having a strategy for everyone. Um, and and uh, not saying this is just the way we're going to do things because that's what we've always done. Let's look at you as an individual. It's so, so important. Can you do IUI without fallopian tubes? No. Uh, the fallopian tubes are essential for sperm to get from A to B, from the uterus to around the ovary. Um, Interuterine insemination actually does mean putting the sperm into the uterus. Um, slightly higher volumes are now used, so actually you are getting the sperm into the tubes. Um, Fertilisation occurs in the tube, so ovulation affected by the fimbrial ends of the tube and the, uh, the egg then passes up the tube and is fertilised within the tube. And then by about day five, when it was formed, is the embryo is a blastocyst, that's when it's really entering the cavity of the uterus and implanting, so you have to have tubes to have IUI. And I would say, if you have tubal damage, IUI is not for you. The success rates are much lower. I was involved in a study um, some years ago looking at our IUI success rates in the NHS hospital in Nottingham, and we had much lower success rates uh, in people who'd had um, endometriosis or adhesions, but had open tubes. So, it, patient selection is really, really crucial to optimise your success rates uh, with IUI and DI. You talked a little bit about the two-week wait after you've had the procedure. Is there anything that people should avoid or symptoms that people should look out for? I, I always say to people, try and live life normally. That goes for IUI, IVF. Obviously, avoid things that you would look back on and say, I wish I hadn't done that. If you're having stimulation, you may feel a bit bloated. You shouldn't develop ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, although those people with PCO having injectable FSH can get mild moderate hyperstimulation syndrome. So that's something to always look out for. It is unlikely. Um, so no, I would say try and lead life normally. You don't have to take time off work. You know, occupy yourself. With, with things to do to try and make that two week wait um, less intense, you know. Um, but again, it's got to be individualized. Um, there are no rights and wrongs, really. Uh, I wouldn't go bungee jumping or hang gliding. So, should people look out for things like implantation bleeding and other symptoms and cramping? I, I struggle with this idea of implantation bleeding. Um, and whether it is an entity, because uh, you know, an embryo implanting shouldn't cause bleeding. You're not breaking a, a, a barrier that, uh, that should induce bleeding. But, you know, it's there and some people will have, may have a little bit of mid-cycle spotting for some reason. Um, everybody is different. We know that uh, some women will be able to tell when they've ovulated because of, of pain. Um, some people will get premenstrual symptoms. Some people won't. Some people will get breast tenderness, which may be indicative of early pregnancy and implantation. It is very individual. And um, you just have to, to go with what your, your body is telling you. Um, but ultimately it comes down to is that test positive and has implantation occurred, um, which, which is very difficult and it does make the two-week wait quite stressful. 
So the next question is kind of how many IUI attempts should people embark on and at what stage might someone consider moving into IVF? It would just be good to understand the kind of um, industry average for IUI and pregnancies. So um, I think a ballpark figure is you'd expect a third people to conceive after three cycles of IUI. A lot of studies have looked at how do you optimize your chances with IUI or DI? Is it going through three cycles of uh, unstimulated, then three cycles of stimulated? Is it six cycles of unstimulated? And often this comes down to a cost benefit um, scenario where you look at what are the costs of this. Um, on the NHS, very little IUI is now done. In our local area, um, some of our patients will get three cycles of IUI and then move on to IVF. If you are self-funding IUI, that becomes a very personal decision as to how much you will invest for what return. I, I think CIUI as a program of treatment initially for three cycles, whether that's with or without stimulation, and then be looking at moving on. Again, if you are younger, your view may be different to somebody who is older. Personally, at 38, I wouldn't recommend somebody having IUI unless they really wanted to. I would suggest it is more cost effective to move on to IVF. And that's where you have to look at cost-effectiveness of a form of treatment when making your decision. Um, that goes for choice of unit. Um, you know, you've got to look at success rates that are relevant to you. Um, when we're talking about IVF success rates, you know, the HFEA produce good data sets showing what the success rates are for your age and, and therefore, you know, always relate statistics to you and your circumstance. So um, certainly after three cycles, I would be reviewing whether you want to continue with IUI or DI. Certainly after six cycles, I think you do need to have a sit down and say, okay, are we gonna move on to something different, IVF or stop treatment? Um, in, that's personal. Great advice. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Hopkisson, for all of your insightful information and education around IUI today. For anyone who is interested in speaking to the wonderful team at TFP Fertility UK, who have clinics all around the UK, then please do follow our link in bio to get in touch with the team who would be delighted to speak to you for personalised advice. Thank you very much. Hey, Mark, thank you for having me on. And uh, you know, if, if people do need help and, and advice, we are here at the end of a telephone, face-to-face, -face, video consultations. Um, all you have to do is get in contact. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you very much for having us. Thank you.